Hello, I'm Greg Swenson and welcome to the Swenson Woodshop. Thanks for selecting my channel. I've been an amateur woodworker for almost 40 years and now that I've retired, I thought it would be fun to start a YouTube channel and share my passion for woodworking. This will be the first video for my new channel and I thought we'd kick start it with a tour of my shop. My shop is a small two car garage, approximately 20 by 20 or 400 square feet. It's a no car zone and is devoted entirely to woodworking. Well, almost entirely. Let's start that tour. We'll start with a 360 degree pan around the shop to give you a quick overview, and then we'll come back and work our way around in more detail. Most of my larger machines are either Powermatic or Delta, with a Minimax bandsaw thrown into the mix, as we'll see when we go into more detail. The shop floor plan somewhat resembles a capital letter H, where the pathways through the shop form the H. As you can see, tools and storage line the walls on the left and right, and there are two machinery groups on the center axis with an open assembly area in the middle, where my camera is currently located. There's a lot packed into this small shop, and I've put considerable effort into organizing it to achieve a workflow that minimizes the need to move tools around. However, it is a small shop, so almost all of the large machines are on mobile bases, so they can be easily moved if needed. I've lost count on the number of times I've rearranged the shop, moving things around to try and get an inch here or an inch there to improve the workflow. While the current arrangement is not perfect, it's getting closer with every iteration. Now if I could just figure out where to put a CNC router and a laser cutter. Hmm. You may notice that the shop is clean and organized, but it's not always that way. I spent a fair amount of time cleaning the shop in preparation for shooting this video. I do normally keep the shop fairly clean since it is attached to the living space and I really don't need sawdust in the house. Plus, now there's the issue of video equipment. I have a good dust collection system attached to most of the stationary tools and I am in the habit of cleaning up after each machining operation. Most of the larger machines require 220 volt power, which is provided through an electrical subpanel here in the garage and distributed to the machines by power drops from the ceiling. Lighting is provided by 10 5000K LED light fixtures, which provide good task lighting and white balance for shooting video. And for those colder days, I installed a natural gas heater, though being located on California's central coast, I don't turn it on very often. So there you have it, a quick overview of the shop. Now let's take a closer look at some of the individual tools and work areas. Starting in the left rear corner of the shop, we'll work our way around in a counterclockwise rotation. In this corner, I have a Powermatic model PM2800 drill press. Under the table is a three drawer cabinet that holds my collection of drill bits, Forstner bits, hole saws, and other boring things. The tool cabinet sits on a rolling stand where various fixtures are stored and can be easily rolled out of the way if I need to lower the drill press table or clean underneath the cabinet. It's a good way to utilize what would otherwise be wasted space with a floor standing drill press. This way, I get the capacity of a floor press and the space efficiency of a bench press. Moving to the left, I have four foot and eight foot Festool tracks hanging on the wall, and then several straight edges and long layout rulers hanging on the side of the plywood storage rack that's positioned behind the hand tool cabinet. More on that in a moment. The upper portion of my hand tool cabinet is an antique I inherited from my father's workshop that used to hold his collection of antique hand tools. Now it's home for my collection of Lai Nelson hand planes, chisels, and hand saws. The drawer section is an addition my father constructed, and I think it complements the upper cabinet quite well. These drawers hold an assortment of layout tools, hand files, cabinet scrapers, and marquetry tools. 
I think the hand tool cabinet makes a nice backdrop for shooting my videos. The lower cabinet I built to complement the upper cabinet, and it holds an assortment of routers, seven of them at last count, a dovetail jig, pocket hole jig, and several pneumatic staplers and brad guns. As you can see, the cabinet still needs some doors, and I think that will be an upcoming project pretty quick here. Behind the hand tool cabinet is my plywood storage area. I don't keep a lot of full sheets on hand, as I generally only purchase plywood as needed for projects, and then I break down full sheets into smaller pieces in the driveway using my track saw before moving them into the shop. I can fit full 4x8 sheets in there, I just have to roll a couple of the tools out of the way to slide the material into the storage rack. It's not an ideal setup, but it's out of the way and uses the same wall space as the hand tool cabinet. Continuing left, I have a Powermatic hollow chisel mortiser, a Delta 14 inch bandsaw, and a Powermatic belt and disc sanding machine. The bandsaw is the smaller of my two bandsaws, and I keep a narrow blade on it for more intricate work, while the larger bandsaw is used primarily for resawing. This 14 inch saw is a model that Delta used to manufacture with a built in gearbox to slow the blade speed down as low as 40 feet per second for cutting steel, although I seldom use it for that purpose. Behind this group of tools is the clamp storage area. I keep an assortment of my nicer Bessie clamps here in the shop, but I also have a collection out in the storage shed behind the house. What's that old saying? You can never have too many clamps? In the front left corner is my Powermatic 8 inch joiner. Positioned here this close to the garage door, I do have to open the door when jointing boards longer than 42 inches, but I have no clearance issues on the infeed side from either the belt sander or bandsaw. Behind the joiner is the dust collector. It's an Oneida 3 horsepower model connected to most of the stationary machines by way of metal spiral pipe, manually operated blast gates, and flex hose. The collector sits above a 35 gallon steel drum, which I normally empty about every other month unless I'm using the thickness planer and jointer more frequently. I use plastic drum liners to make disposal of the waste easier. When the drum gets full, I roll the joiner out of the way to access the drum, pull out the plastic liner, and drop it in the trash bin. I also clean the filter about the same time, usually by just setting it out in the driveway and taking my leaf blower to it. Tucked under the dust collector's filter is a small air compressor that I use for operating pneumatic staplers and with the attached hose will reach anywhere in the shop. And that's it for the left side of the shop. Now, let's move to the front center section. In the front center section, I have a Powermatic PM2000 table saw with a 54 inch fence and a four foot outfeed table backing up to the garage door and tucked into the back corner is my router table. Under the right side extension is storage for miter gauges, table saw jigs, and vacuum cleaners. I have a WAP shop vac which I use for most of the cleanup tasks, and a Festool CT Mini, which I use with all of my portable Festools and a few other non-Festools. Keeping the shop clean certainly makes working out here more enjoyable. The router table has an Excalibur lift, fence, and cast iron table sitting on a Rockler base cabinet with a three and a quarter horsepower Porter cable motor. I used to have a 5 horsepower Powermatic shaper with a power feeder, but found that I used it so infrequently and that I could do almost everything on the router table that I had previously done on the shaper. So being as this is a small shop, it found a new home in a commercial millwork shop. Similar to the joiner, I have to open the garage door when working with longer boards on the table saw or router table but I can work with boards up to five feet in length on the table saw before the door needs to be opened. The outfeed table also serves as a storage rack for smaller pieces of wood, my crosscut sled, and some of my stained glass supplies. I store my vacuum press here because the outfeed table 
is where I normally set up the vacuum press bags when using this system. That completes the front center section. Now let's take a look at the right hand side of the shop. First up is a Delta 15 inch thickness planer, a Hegner scroll saw, and a Supermax drum sander. The thickness planer still has the original straight knife cutter head, but I've been thinking about changing it to one of the newer helical heads. My joiner has a helical head, and I like the longevity of the carbide inserts and the lower noise levels that these cutters produce compared to straight knives. I did this type of conversion on a joiner I used to have several years ago and can attest to the difference in noise levels firsthand. The 5 inch flex hose hanging over the scroll saw gets connected to the planer when I roll it out of its parking space for use. On the wall behind the hose is a Powermatic tenoning jig and an old Delta coping sled and to the right is the electrical sub panel for the shop and the juice box. No, it's not a kid's drink, it's the charging unit for my electric car. On the shelves above these tools, I store longer length veneer bundles and other veneer supplies. The plastic tubs hold sequenced match burls and the boxes have loose veneer remnants, both commercial and shop sawn. Moving left is a tool cabinet for socket sets, wrenches, and other similar automotive type tools. The area in front of this cabinet is also where I normally park the smaller of my two wood turning lathes. I've recessed the tool cabinet slightly, not enough to make accessing the top drawer difficult, but just enough to keep the pathway open when the lathe is parked here so I can roll the trash and recycle bins out to the street without moving any machinery on trash day. Above the tool cabinet is my sharpening center. I have a Toyson variable speed grinder with CBN wheels that I use to sharpen my turning tools and to hollow grind chisels and plane irons prior to sharpening with water stones. I do plan to produce a video on how I sharpen chisels, planes, and cabinet scrapers in the near future. On the shelves above the sharpening center, I have miscellaneous hardware and fasteners organized in cardboard bins by size and type. Moving left is my Festool miter saw station. I have the miter saw recessed level with the bench tops on either side and it's aligned with the throat of the band saw in the rear shop door so I can feed in long boards from the left side of the saw without any difficulty as you will see momentarily. I have six feet of off cut room to the right of the saw blade and if I need more room on the right I can always crank up the drum sander head and run boards out the garage door. Below the saw is my jet spindle sander. It's also on casters, so I can roll it out, lock the casters, connect the shop vac, pull up a folding chair, and sit down to use it. It's the perfect height when I use it that way, and it's too high for me if I lift it up on my bench. Plus, it's heavy. Behind the spindle sander is the miter saw's dust collector. The miter saw is connected to an Oneida Dust Deputy Sustainer Cyclone and then to a Festool CT26. This setup works pretty well. The dust collection on the miter saw is quite good, and while it doesn't get 100% of the sawdust, it does capture most of it. The rest is contained to the boxed-in area behind the saw. I installed this arrangement about three years ago and have emptied the 9-gallon dust deputy once, but have yet to replace the vacuum bag in the CT26. The shelves above the miter saw hold my sanding blocks and sandpaper. I like the Veritas sanding blocks. I have five of them with grits ranging from 120 to 400 pre-staged so I can grab the grit I want at the time I need it. The area to the left of the miter saw has a lot of my wood turning supplies. Below the bench top are various rectangular turning blanks, pen blanks, and other supplies. The shelves above hold an assortment of kiln-dried bowl blanks and foam-backed sanding rolls. All those turning blanks are just waiting for some inspiration. The microwave oven is handy not only for rewarming my morning coffee, but also for drying small pieces of wood for turning. I'll get a lot of grief if I stink up the house drying wood in the kitchen microwave. 
Moving into the right rear corner of the shop, I have my lumber storage area and the larger of my two bandsaws. I don't keep a lot of lumber on hand for several reasons. First, I don't have a lot of room, and second, it ties up a lot of money in what for me is a slow-moving inventory. With that being said, I do have a good supply of quarter sawn white oak and Clara walnut, in addition to a wide assortment of exotic hardwoods that I mostly resaw into veneers for marquetry projects. The bandsaw is an older Minimax 16 inch saw that I use mostly for resawing. I have the saw set up with a Laguna Driftmaster fence, Carter blade guides, and a Lennox TriMaster carbide blade. As mentioned earlier, the bandsaw is aligned with the miter saw and the rear shop door to facilitate feeding long boards. The bandsaw has 17 inches of throat with the fence removed, but even with the fence and blade installed as shown here, I am able to feed a 12 inch wide board through the throat to the miter saw. Very seldom do I work with long boards wider than 12 inches. And lastly for the right side is the utility sink which is quite handy for laundry, filling the car wash bucket, cleaning paint brushes, and sharpening operations such as flattening water stones. I'll demonstrate how to flatten water stones in an upcoming sharpening video coming soon to a YouTube channel near you. And that's it for the right side of the shop. Let's move now to the rear center section. In this center section are my lathes, turning tools, and main workbench. The smaller of my two lathes is this Rikon 7220, which as previously mentioned is normally parked either in front of the automotive tool cabinet or in this location, just depending on what I'm working on at the time. The plastic tubs in the base cabinet hold an assortment of chucks, face plates, centers, and other equipment and supplies for wood turning. The larger of my lathes is Powermatic 3520B. I find it convenient having two lathes as there are times when I don't want to remove a project from the lathe but I need to work on turning something else. I also find that whenever I start working on a lathe project my wife suddenly gets inspired to start turning pens or some other work. I've threatened to sell the small lathe several times as I could use the real estate but she always talks me out of it. Behind the lathe is my collection of turning tools. I put up the stub wall behind the lathe to give me a surface to mount the tool racks on, but it also works to keep the sawdust and chips out of the laundry area on the other side of the wall. The laundry area will not be included in our tour. After all, this is supposed to be a shop tour, not a home and garden tour. And finally, the workbench. I built this workbench back in 1994 based on the shaker style benches I saw in the workbench book written by Scott Landis. My workbench was originally 11 feet long with four drawers and four doors but when I moved from my previous shop to this two car garage I had to downsize and cut four feet off the bench to fit it into the new tool arrangement. One of my woodworking neighbors became the beneficiary of a four foot bench. Mounted under this end of the workbench, I have a small computer that I use for watching YouTube videos, purchasing shop supplies, and viewing my talking points while filming in the shop. I've even used it to order an online pizza delivery while busy in the shop. This end of the workbench is also home for my Festool collection. Above the Festools is a metal working bench vise mounted on a board that I can lift up and clamp down on the workbench whenever I need to use this type of vise. I also have a 12 inch Craftsman bench vise on this end and when I originally built the bench it had a matching vise on the other side. One vise for each of my two boys. Well they've both grown up and moved out and with the lathe now located on the other side of the bench there isn't any room for the second vise. I still have it stored out in the shed with the other homeless tools from my shop. Perhaps I'll use it again someday. At this end of the bench I have a Veritas twin screw vise. I probably use this vise more than any of the others and frequently to hold my shooting board which is conveniently stored just below the vise. 
From this angle, you can still see the hinge pockets from the left-hand door of the set that were removed. So there you have it, the Swenson Woodshop. As you can see from this image, there's not much room for any more tools. A few other things I thought of while I was editing this video. Rubber floor mats certainly make standing for an extended period of time more comfortable, and they help to protect tools and pieces of wood from damage if accidentally dropped. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of mats in the shop because they also make it difficult to roll around heavy machinery, and in this small shop, I am frequently moving something. I do have a floor mat behind the main workbench where I stand most of the time, and I also have several small mats that I can move about the shop if I'm standing in one area for an extended period of time, like when I'm working on the lathe. Remember back at the beginning of the tour when I said my garage is devoted entirely to woodworking? Well, almost. I didn't show you the laundry area. There are a couple other things that didn't make it into the tour, like a shelving unit back by the laundry machines where I store glue and other supplies, nor did we take a trip out back to the storage shed to see my lumber overflow or where I store paints and finishing supplies and my collection of homeless tools. Sometimes too much is just too much. So that completes our tour today. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I've enjoyed sharing it with you. Till next time, I'm Greg Swenson, and this has been the Swenson Woodshop. Now get out in your shop and build something.